Welcome to another Green Talk webinar. My name is Paige and I will be your host for today. Uh, our webinar today is about emerging pest issues for 2019. Uh, we have two guests joining us to talk to us about those today. So we will go through those briefly. I'm just gonna go through this quick slide deck just to kind of go over some housekeeping rules and then we'll get going. Okay, so our agenda, so just a brief overview. So first we're gonna be talking with Tracy Bout from OMAFRA about emerging pest issues in the 2019 uh, She will answer your questions, and then we'll move on to uh, managing disease issues for the 2019 crop with Albert Canuda. We'll answer your questions, and then we'll go from there. So first off, we'll start with Tracy. Uh, she will be talking again to emerging pest issues, and we'll talk with Albert quite right after. So I'm going to give the floor to Tracy, and she will go through her slide deck for you. Thanks, Paige. Welcome, everyone. I'm it's one of those years that um, <laughs> you're going to have to um, take this with a grain of salt because there are, it's an unprecedented year. And certainly um, these are a bit of a guesses of what we could have as issues. Um, I have been the field crop entomologist with OMAFRA for 19 years now and haven't seen a year like this. Um, thanks. One positive thing about having a delayed planting situation is that we did avoid a lot of the early season pests in most cases, but with growing degree days behind, um, the pests are delayed too. So quite literally this morning, I had a call about European chafer grubs as larvae still taking out uh, four, four or five leaf stage corn. Those should be pupating at this time and almost emerging as adults. So it's just one of those years where expect the unexpected and um, don't go by the calendar date, that's for sure. Um, many of those pests that we avoided with, with um, or usually avoid with early planting um, are going to be our potential threats this year. And of course, if the conditions stay wet, um, predictions, uh, most are, are the same as what I have in this, but if we do turn dry, um, a few other pests could be an issue. But first I wanted to point out that we should take this into consideration because we had such delayed planting, you need to look at the foliar insecticide labels when you're having to manage certain, some of the pests because whether you used a diamide or a neonic seed treatment, some of those labels either do not allow you to use the foliar in that same group or there's at least a 45 in the case of indigo or a um, 60 de um, day delay before you can use um, foliar on um, with lumavia and, and um, lumiderm, for example. And in particular with the diamides group 28, we're talking corrigin and volume express, which are two that are, are quite used a lot in this, um, in corn especially in, um, going forward. So here's my list of potential best guesstimates of what could be an issue. Don't hold me accountable to these because I think a few more may come on the list. But certainly cereal um, aphids and leaf beetle, which we'll talk about, true army worm, western bean, I'll talk about that one, um, corn earworm, and maybe even first generation bean leaf beetle. And I also want to point out um, two other things to watch for this season. So first, cereal leaf beetle. We certainly do still have them present in winter wheat and even more so, um, it's more important in areas like Simcoe County that may just um, be reaching the T3 fungicide application timing. Um, that's when it's still a good time to uh, tank mix with an insecticide if cereal leaf beetle is active. But for the most part, I think any populations that we still have may be moving into spring cereals. So I do want you guys to pay attention to that. Um, one cereal leaf beetle adult or larva per stem after boot but prior to heading is the threshold but also if you start to see significant feeding on that flag leaf. Um, you, typically we don't see any merit in spraying once you're in the once you're past the early heading stages. Another thing that has been um, popping up is cereal aphids and that's a complex of a, a, a number of different species. Um, Again, there we're in winter wheat, but I think most of that risk has passed. I think spring cereals has the potential if natural enemies aren't keeping up. So the threshold there is 12 to 15 aphids per stem prior to heading. Um, there's usually no merit to spraying once it's headed, with the exception there are thresholds of 50 aphids per head, but the crop really needs to be in um, another um, stress like drought to um, be a concern. 
One that I do see as being um, a big threat is, is true armyworm. We've been catching armyworm here in Ontario and elsewhere um, for quite some time now, and I see them having a struggle finding crops. So they may have been already laid. Um, the, the moths prefer grassy plants um, like corn and cereals and even the poorly um, controlled weeds in the fields like we've had this year, or even rye cover grass, cover crops. Um, so I see with the corn being quite young, um, the threshold is still quite low. So in seedling corn, two or more unparasitized larvae per seedling or 10% of the plants with feeding is the threshold. Once the corn crop gets past the six leaf stage, it it's, um, can tolerate the feeding more and you need about 50% of the plants um, with leaf feeding. But with all of these lap larvas, caterpillars, they need to be smaller than one and a half centimeters for insecticides to work. Um, so hopefully, typically in corn, they don't feed on the growing point, but except with the exception of young corn. So um, please keep an eye out. I know just yesterday, Jocelyn Smith saw pretty decent sized true armyworm in corn in a plot that she was looking in. So they're out there. I am more concerned with mixed forages and, and especially spring cereals um, because if the corn wasn't in uh, or, or merging um, when they, those moths were laying their eggs, they likely found forages and cereals instead. And so the thresholds there are five or more in mixed forages and four to five in cereal crop. And I keep bringing up the unparasitized larva because that is important. There is a tachinid fly that likes to lay its eggs on really close to the head of the larva. Those um, hatch and the maggots mine into the um, armyworm and actually feed on them from the inside. So there's no point in spraying if they are present. And you might also even see a virus that takes them out where the caterpillar, it messes with their mind and they're, um, they have this instinct of climbing to the top of the plant they're on and just dying. So if you see mummified bodies of what look like um, armyworm, that's what's happened. And so they don't need to be sprayed in that situation. Next is Western bean cutworm. And this one is the big unknown. We're all guessing a bit. And I should have mentioned this earlier. We are meeting on a biweekly basis as the North American field crop entomologist just to, to get a sense on, on the call what everyone's seeing because we've all not experienced this kind of year. So um, it's a learning curve. And so we're using our collective knowledge to figure out what might happen. Um, with Western bean, again, with the growing degree days so delayed, I think we're going to see our typical peak flight at least a week later, if not more. And the problem being that typically places like Essex or even Chatham-Kent area can usually avoid much of peak flight because this moth is really attracted to um, pre-tassel to full tassel stage corn. But this year, that <laughs> we're going to see that going into August. And so I suspect we're going to have a longer period where fields are ideal for moths. Um, but the big unknown is how they overwintered and how well they're doing because um, Western bean overwinters as a pre-pupa in the soil and um, until from November till early July. So it's a long period of them being there um, and um, trying to survive. We haven't had such a wet um, and frequent wet soil conditions this year. So Cold winters don't impact them, but we're wondering if saturated soils can, especially if entomal pathogens can um, pop up, So, and, and which is a fungus that can kill the larva. So we're waiting to see what kind of um, uh, moth uh, emergence we see. We may, they may not be as much of an issue, but for sure peak flight will be delayed by a week. Um, and unfortunately, I think pre-tassel and even dry beans are gonna line up um, and into later into the summer than we're usual. So don't rely on, I usually scout Western bean early July until the third or fourth week of July. That's not gonna happen this year. You're looking into um, expanding that scouting until early August at least to, to see um, what's going on. And, and unfortunately, Albert may bring this up, uh, you know, conditions may be right for dawn as well. And so the corn is going to be in the in the field for a lot longer than usual in the fall and um, we've, we're going to see some earworm uh, issues um, potentially with that um, young crop that's out there now. 
Again, um, the threshold hasn't changed though. We still do feel that you scout at least three weeks and um, accumulate the threshold. Um, so if 5% of the, all the plants that you've been looking at has uh, an egg mass on them, then you do need to spray. What will be tricky, however, is um, applying that insecticide because we do want to see it at full silking if possible. That's the best time to get all the larvae that are on those plants. Um, but it will have to really pay attention to when the moths are active and when full silk hits. Uh, the timing might be off for, for application. And I can't stress how important it is to be rotating. So currently we now only have the VIP trait that controls um, Western bean cutworm. We don't want to lose it, so we don't want everyone to just rely on that trait alone for this pest. Um, we, we would like to see yearly rotation of these different management strategies. Um, and I know a lot of people also use Corrigin. And if we use that year to year, uh, we may actually push Western bean to resistance. So we really are trying to encourage to rotate yearly with the different management tools that we have. Um, but keep an eye out, especially especially any larvae that are on those ears and on those plants, um, even going into September, um, could be an issue with um, ear mold development. A good news thing, I hope, um, we have changed up the Western Mean Cutworm Trap Network. It's no longer on the Corn Pest Coalition website, but we um, currently uh, have its um, at least the links on field crop news until it can become a, its own um, website. To get to it, there is there are tabs right along the, the front page of um, field crop news. You click right on the pest monitoring network. That'll get you to the front page of the network, but there's also trapping resources for, currently right now for Western bean as well as corn borer, although I hope to get corn earworm up there as well. Once you get into that, um, that front page article, you will get the important links that are needed. So one is a trap site survey, which is where you'd set up your trap sites as well as um, input all your weekly trap counts. There's also the interactive map and a user dashboard, which is new. And, and the reason we changed this up to, to call it the Great Lakes and Maritimes Pest Monitoring Network is that a number of um, neighboring states and provinces have been interested in, in starting to um, map our catches so that we can all help um, use those to determine what's going on um, and help predict um, what we think may happen. So once you click, you've got the option with that trap set trap um, network setup page um, on a mobile device or on your browser. And um, as I said, we are now trapping for a number of the different corn pests. Um, so whatever trap sites you have, you can enter there um, as well. It, this is PDF, so unfortunately I can't show you the interactiveness of this, but um, here are our traps so far. Um, and you can uh, go on the right side of the screen and click on the layer list and see each individual individual um, range of, of the pests that we're monitoring for. But most important is we've got a big gap still in Ontario that we're waiting for these western mean cutworm traps to come up. And I know it's early. I realize the season we've had. But because it's been such an unprecedented season, we need traps up so that we can tell when moths are emerging or arriving and try and gauge what we expect to happen in relation to what the crop stage is like right now. So any of you that have traps in the past, um, if you can get them up again and enter them into the network, much appreciated. The other part of the network that's um, helpful is that on each individual trap site, you can click on them and get the detailed information of what exactly is being trapped and what the most recent um, moth count was for those traps. And, you know, feel free to contact me if you have issues. I know a few trap sites were on the coast of Africa recently, so we've, we fixed those, um, those ones. Um, but it's, it is a still a uh, learning curve, I, I realize. The not, another nice feature is that we have a dashboard now. So we know that currently there's 72 traps being reported through the network, and we can see individually how when, what we're catching on average and um, in particular I know just this week we caught a, a European corn borer hybrid uh, moth so that's a new feature and and um, true armyworm is um, catching up I know the Ridgetown one had 38 this week
So that's the network. As, as I said, it includes all of the pests. So another one that we're, we're going to be looking um, for traps on is, is corn earworm. This was a problem last year. We had a really big flush of summer moth flights um, deep into uh, summer and early fall, uh, all of Eastern Canada to the, the West or the East Coast. Um, usually not a problem in field corn, but they do enter the ear and can um, expose that ear for ear molds. Um, I, the problem with corn earworm is that they prefer late planted corn. So again, our crop is lining up to really be attractive to these ear um, feeders. And so I see them wanting to lay eggs in um, in much of our crop if flushes come in. And I know Quebec just caught a moth last week. So they are starting to come in from those weather fronts that um, we've been receiving from the southern U.S. This is another one I need us to keep an eye out for. So some of you may have seen the report that we do have. We've, we've um, confirmed that European corn borer is resistant to Cry1F in the Maritimes. And um, we suspect maybe we've had some une unexpected damage even in southern Quebec. So now we need to keep an eye out for this um, for all of the different BTs because even having one, one trait um, compromise puts strain on the other traits. And so um, this is a pest we haven't seen in a long time. Um, we are looking for larvae to collect or even egg masses. So if you see any of the signs like the leaf feeding or the mining into the whirl of the, the um, crop, the plant, or the mining in from the leaf axle and, and the frass, please notify myself or your corn company agronomist so that we can um, make collections and um, test those to see if they are resistant. We, we've got a whole um, group of people from Nova Scotia to, and Maine all the way across to Michigan and Manitoba keeping an eye out for European corn borer this year and, and um, ready to collect if we need to. If you want more information, we've, we've got a lot of um, information on the Corn Pest um, Coalition site and as well the Field Crop News site, um, including a document showing you the signs that you look for for European corn borer um, damage. Turning from corn to beans, um, this is a guess, but um, bean leaf beetle has the opportunity this year. I would say typically um, very cold winters do knock them back, but I also know that they can still, they've been noticed, they can feed on forages even if there are no soybeans emerging at the time that that overwintering population comes up. So I think we're lining us, our, us up to see that first generation going into soybeans. So um, again, as a reminder, bean leaf beetle can be various colors. It can have these rectangular spots or not, but they always have that triangle um, on, on the base of their wings and um, as I said they over the they overwinter at, from the previous year's adults and are usually the ones that come in to seed and crop but since there may have not been soybeans yet for them to feed on I think they went to forages or legumes or clover and then um, laid eggs and we expect that that first generation of adults that love late planted soybeans to go in and lay their eggs on to get their offspring on early pods um, may be an issue this year. So to remind you, it's, it is more of an issue for IP and food grade or seed fields in particular. Um, defoliation by these pests, this pest isn't as big of a deal. Um, we tend not to reach thresholds for the, uh, the defoliation, but it, the pod feeding is a concern. And so if 10% of the pods have um, feeding injury and the beetles are still active, or even if they're clipping, they start to clip the pods off for whatever reason, they don't even feed on the pods, they just clip them off the plant, then a spray is warranted. And, and I do suspect that we may see um, more activity this year given the crop is um, so late um, to be coming up. And finally, I have one more new one to keep an eye on for. for and I can't, pro I can't guarantee that this will show up in Ontario, but it is in states a little too close for comfort um, that I want us to keep an eye out for. So this is soybean gall midge. It was first 
detected in um, 2011, but they've been seeing infestations in 2016, 2017, and now in particular 2018 in Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, and Minnesota. They are, it's the first documented gall midge known to be on soybeans. In fact, it just, just recently got its genus name. It hasn't even been identified to species yet, but it is in the same family as Swede midge and Hessian fly. And if you are aware of those names, then it, it is something to be a bit concerned about. Um, they are quite small though. They have bands on their legs, um, sort of look like a mosquito, but as you can see from the picture of the, with the vial, how tiny they really are. The, the, there's multiple generations. We don't even know if there's alternative hosts, um, but the adults can come in. They're, they're catching them now um, in those four states, and they lay their eggs at the very base of the plant, um, in fact, in the node before the cotyledon, and their maggots um, grow in between the, the um, first layers of the stem and cause it to canker and just die. And so typically they are seeing injury along the edge of the field more than anywhere and especially fields bordering previous soybean crops. Um, but if you see, they start out as white maggots, but then um, as they mature, they turn orange. And if you see any maggot growing on uh, in the stem of a soybean plant, please contact me. You will go from seeing just a bit of a canker um, to full-grown death full-blown death of the plant, even the, the um, growing points. And what's odd about this is that they have been associated with other diseases like stem canker, charcoal rot, pod stem, pod and stem blight, and even um, my Manitoba colleague thinks he saw them a few years back on white mold plants. So whether they're, um, they're attracted to a, the disease or um, causing the, that introduction. We're not sure yet, but there's a strong association to a number of the different um, plant diseases. And here's just a map of the emergence cages that they have so far. All of the red dots are where they've actually caught adults as of last week. Um, the black is where, again, these traps have been put where they were found last year. So we are a bit concerned about this new one coming in. 65 counties in these four states had um, gall med, so uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on this. And um, with that, I, that's all of my predictions so far, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we do have a question, actually. So um, if weather turns dry this summer, what issues can we see then? Uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> there's a few more that I would predict. Um, I think, especially in the soybeans, I think um, there's a chance for soybean aphids. Uh, they certainly did not find soybeans when they came off buckthorn, so it would definitely have to be migrants coming from the U.S., but if they do arrive, again, they're going to find a young crop, so I have a long time to develop on that, um, and the crop gets stressed when it when it becomes dry. Um, another are, are thrips, both in corn and soybeans, because again, um, once it turns dry, the thrips really thrive on that, and um, the crop's going to be young and um, uh, mites obviously that's that's probably the um, most biggest risk is again spider mites uh, young crop um, these mites can take it down if the crop is getting pretty stressed and ha came out in poor soil conditions to begin with um, one question um, so if cutworms are a problem do you know already how long can we expect them to be a problem for? Yes, yeah, so uh, black cutworms, we, this is another thing that um, should be gone by now, but they're not. Um, black cutworms and dingy cutworms have been, they're still being found in um, corn and other crops. Again, they, they found a lot of fields that had low-lying weed still, because we just couldn't get in them to spray, and the larvae have done well. So. There's also a mix mixture of sizes. So some are big and ready to pupate and stop feeding, but others are still at a decent stage um, to spray. So it is something to keep an eye out for. Typically, we'd be done that um, by now, but uh, given the growing degree days, we've got a few more weeks of activity by cutworms. I think we have another question. 
So where can we get the Western bean cutworm traps? Oh, good question. So um, typically a lot of the corn companies do provide the trap. Um, I certainly don't have the trap, the physical trap uh, then to share. The, bu the bucket traps, if you've had them in the past, the, they will work for this year as well. I do have some limited supply of lures for growers who do need lures still. So they can contact me directly for the lures. But if you don't have a trap, then um, maybe nudge your agronomist and see if they have a trap that um, you can set up. All right, well, thanks for answering all those questions and thank you for your time. I'm gonna turn it over to Albert right now for our next portion of this webinar. Well, thank you, Paige, and thank you, the GFO, for the opportunity this afternoon to, you know, just put some of my thoughts together in terms of just like Tracy did in terms of uh, what we could expect this year and, and potentially some some issues that uh, could result due to the unprecedented uh, events in spring that we've been dealing with uh, and continue to deal with this year. Um, you know, I've been the extension plant pathologist for the math for us since 1991, as Tracy has mentioned. I haven't um, seen this situation in my 28, 29 years as well, and uh, talking to a number of colleagues in the U.S. and a number of uh, you know, many of you on the phone here today or on the, this webinar, um, the same thing. And so we are in uncharted waters. We are going to see a lot of pests and growth stages out of whack. Tracy mentioned some earlier. And, you know, it's just going to be the year of the unusual. So we're going to see all kinds of odd things this year. And some of the um, topics I'd like to just touch on are some of the things is, you know, we're getting a lot of questions on, of course, on the gibberella ear rot and dawn side of things, cyst nematode, SDS, you know, white mold, fusarium head blight, which we're just starting to, to see right now. And then uh, just like uh, with uh, midge, the Tracy soybean midge, um, tar spot as well as a potential risk for us as well. So those are some of the topics I'd like to touch on to today as we go. We know in, in our experiences in the past with gibberella ear rot and dawn mycotoxins and that, that weather plays a key role. And we saw in, in 2018 that the weather events that we had um, throughout the season had, and particularly late in the season, had significant impact on both the, the ear mold side of things, but also subsequently on, on the dawn side as well. And uh, also in that regards, we, we saw um, issues with uh, um, late planted uh, corn, say in Essex County, um, and compared to other parts of, of the province that uh, went in early in you know, May, June into more favorable conditions that, uh, and much earlier than what we saw this year. But if we use Essex as a potential example last year where we had substantial acres of late planted corn that developed later on into the season into those more favorable environmental conditions. Those, you know, by delaying, this year we're going to have substantial delayed planting, reduced uh, development going into those August, September um, environmental conditions that often end up being more cooler, uh, more wetter, more importantly than precipitation that we often think about is those heavy dews. We saw the dew points last year were, were very significant. And those heavy dews that we saw in fields into the afternoon drove a lot of what we saw last year in terms of both the disease infection and subsequent uh, mycotoxin development. So we are potentially um, setting ourselves up into that same type of situation where we get into September, October, where not only precipitation concerns are, it is those, those dew um, conditions, those dew points, and um, we, we're gonna need that whole fall to, to fill, this, fill this crop or fill the grain as well. And so of course there is a big concern and we've been getting all kinds of calls on this and you know, what's the impact of the delayed crop? You know, the silking and grain field period is gonna be moved back. So again, that, that potentially increases our risk. Again, this is um, past history or, or what, we, what we could expect based on, on some of the predictions of uh, the weather forecasts and that. But again, um, you know, these are things to, to consider um, uh, going into this year. As we said, though, those heavy dews, those, those rain conditions, anything that's going to result in any delayed harvest is going to 
going to potentially increase our risk again this year um, from uh, ear rot and, and potentially uh, mycotoxin uh, issues as well. And so we know that, uh, you know, there are differences in hybrids. And so this year is um, a lot of people will be scouting in the fields. And, and, and you know, we're talking about ear rots and, and dawn and mycotoxin right now. But this is going to be regardless of whether you're talking insect pests like Tracy just did or, or pathogens or diseases as we are touching on today. The important thing is to be out in the field as much as possible. See what's going on because, as we said, there's going to be a lot of unusual things uh, going on there. So the more... Um, the more eyes in the fields, the better this year. Uh, you know, in terms of ear rots and dawn, getting out there and, and looking at uh, scouting those fields. There are hybrids that tend to be maybe more susceptible. But again, with the environment and all that, um, what we've got in terms of uh, hybrid ratings and that will, may not be uh, in jive as well. So those are, are, are we're in uncharted water in, in many of these uh, conditions. But getting out there, scouting, and being out in the field is going to be probably one of the most important take-homes of, uh, of, of this message today. And we've been getting lots of calls on, on the fungicide side of things. And, and so when we talk about fungicides and talking about fungicides in corn, there are many things to be considered um, in here. And, and not just on the, on the dawn side that we saw last year, but because of the weather this year. So a lot of discussion, a lot of questions around fungicides. Now remember, when we talk about fungicides in corn, um, two different uh, uh, purposes in many cases. If we're targeting those foliar leaf diseases, those northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spots, and that, that again, could be um, more favorable, and we'll talk about that later on because of the delayed nature of the crop this year, or even the non-disease plant health effects. You know, our timing is, is, is different than, say, the ear rot mycotoxin side of things, where we're targeting the, the tassel emergence for foliar diseases, where we need the silks out uh, for those ear rot mycotoxin fungicide applications. So timing is going to be uh, an issue this year. It's going to be um, a challenge in many cases. We saw that in wheat. We saw um, in, in when we were T3 applications for, for fungicides uh, for Fusarium head blight that the um, heading dates and uh, flowering dates uh, were quite variable throughout the fields. Um, you know, one of the good things that, uh, and we were just talking about that this morning as we were going through fields uh, the past few days in, in the southwest here, that emergence and, and that has actually been pretty good overall, uh, better than what we considered, considering how, you know, how soupy, how unfit some of the, the fields went into, that uh, emergence has been not too bad. Um, and so hopefully that that plant-to-plant -plant variability may not be as big an issue as, as maybe what we saw with wheat and corn. But again, uh, it's going to be a field-by-field -field, um, situation and, uh, and that as well. But it is definitely going to be a challenge so that, you know, that tassel application and more importantly, the ear rot uh, dawn um, R1 um, to to full silking um, stage is going to timing is going to be very difficult as you can see you know going we can move things pretty quickly from a full silk up to um, full browning of the silks being too late for a fungicide so again the window is going to be short so that's going to put a lot of pressure on uh, the ability to to get uh, product out there get get it out onto the fields, the, um, just the, the manpower and equipment uh, in such a short time in many cases. Now, we will have, um, we have many different uh, planting situations throughout or planting dates throughout the province that uh, can, or even in the regions that could help and in, in, in alleviate some of that. But again, that variability is going to be uh, very similar to what we what we potentially saw saw in wheat. So that will be a challenge. And again, need to be out there and 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 scouting and 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 being aware of where we're at on that. And so when we talk about uh, management for for dawn and dawn risks this year, as Tracy mentioned, um, insecticides uh, may be an important uh, component there. Whether we're talking about western bean cutworm or um, 
corn earworms, um, those having an insecticide in with the fungicide, in particular when we're talking the prolines and carambas here uh, for, for ear rot and dawn uh, control, um, maybe a, a strategy, and many growers are, are, are planning to, to have that insecticide fungicide a mix there if, if they are going out. And then again, that timing, the water volumes, all of those things are, are going to be um, important. One thing we did learn from last year when it came to um, the, the harvesting and, and grain quality in that, that the awareness was so high that in many cases, uh, the in-field adjustments that producers made in the field in terms of the combine setups, cleanouts, et cetera, had very good clean grain coming out of the combine with post-cleaning um, in um, on the farm didn't reduce a lot of that dawn in many cases because the the product of the grain coming out of the field was was so clean and and so that was a, a positive we can we can leave a lot of the infected uh, um, parts or the the inoculum or that out in into the uh, um, in the field um, as 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 blowout and cleanouts as that as well but again um, that that the late harvest that moving into uh, um, farther into the season does pose a risk and it will be um, quite a bit of challenges there as well. Um, so when we talk about um, not only the dawn side or the ear rot side, um, late season foliar uh, diseases are, are potentially uh, uh, an issue as we always see when we run into late um, plantings in that, in particular, say, northern corn leaf blight, where we have, and I've been talking about this, and many of you heard me in the past, in terms of the new races of the fungus that we're seeing. You know, we are seeing the challenges of, um, of the susceptibility of hybrids now because those resistance genes that have been so effective because of these new races able to bypass that resistance, and, and we are seeing the introduction of new effective resistance genes. But again, that's going to take time to, to, to build into the system, but we are making, or the companies and, and the breeding programs are doing a great job in, in introducing some of these newer resistance genes. So there's a, quite a bit of promise there on the northern corn leaf blight as well, side as well. But again, those favorable weather conditions because we are going to be moving the, the growth stages later into the season into those more favorable weather conditions could result in, in some uh, foliar in northern corn leaf blight and other of the uh, foliar leaf diseases, particularly northern corn leaf blight. And, and it can go from small chlorotic yellow spots to significant leaf lesions in, in you know, less than a month in that. So under favorable conditions, um, we have, we can see substantial injury and potential impact on yields in that. And so when considering fungicide applications, what we've always seen in terms of, say, the profitability or return on investment, one of the factors that we always um, talk about is, is that late planted corn, and we are in that situation. So um, something to consider uh, when it comes to uh, return on investment of, of, of fungicides, that late planted corn is, is a factor, as well as many others that we talk about. And so we may be in that situation. And we've been part of a, a recent uh, long-term uh, study a meta-analysis of various different uh, uh, field trials in the United States in the Midwest as well as in Ontario and it just got published a month ago and uh, we were looking at various different application timings early to to late and combination of those and we saw that the greatest yield um, occurred at the the VT timing as well as the V6 and and or the six leaf as well as the VT but that majority of that is all coming from that tassel application. When we were looking at a, an early application on its own, we did not see that that uh, significant uh, yield um, increase um, or the benefit of that. Another uh, interesting um, outcome of the project was that uh, you're seeing more and more products having uh, multiple modes of actions, these multi-mixes, and in many cases, um, looking at uh, uh, mixes with, say, the DMIs, uh, the Group 3 uh, fungicides, the QEIs, the Group 11 fungicides, significantly increased uh, yield response when it came to these foliar leaf diseases and that. So again, as you're seeing, the industry is moving towards more multi-mixes, multi-actives, um, not only from a resistance standpoint, 
but also from um, just the better overall response and, and better disease control as well that we're seeing. And again, this year, um, part of that paper too was looking at market prices and application costs. And again, um, you know, the, the higher the, um, the cost of corn, um, the, the greater the return on investment, the break-even scenario. And we're seeing that this year um, with the pressure on corn prices because of uh, the situation in terms of uh, non-plantable acres or the amount of corn that did not or potentially did not get into the ground, whether in, Ont in Ontario or the Midwest U.S. that are definitely going to potentially put a lot of pressure on, on corn. So again, the higher the corn prices, um, the, 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 the better the return on investment or the break-even in, scenario with, with fungicides as well. A lot of this information um, on the particular um, fungicides, um, many of the, you know, whether it's the ear rots or a lot of the uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat diseases, um, GFO has supported our involvement in the Crop Protection Network. So there's all kinds of information um, here, whether we're looking at the efficacies of the different fungicides for corn, soybeans, and wheat, or just general disease information and management, you can go to the CropProtectionNetwork.org website or GFO uh, website, and, and there's a lot of information there, and it's an excellent resource um, to, to go with. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions on the soybean cyst nematode side of things as well. And uh, when it comes to cyst nematode, um, it's important this year is, is just get out there. Dig those roots, look for those females. We know we're seeing a lot of changes. We're seeing challenges with cyst nematode. We're seeing pressure, just like I mentioned on the northern corn leaf blight, with um, um, the new HG types of cyst nematode that are able to bypass the resistance, particularly the PI88788 source of resistance, and that. Um, so that. Uh, there's a big campaign on the uh, with the Soybean Cyst Nematode Coalition. Um, the website there uh, provides a lot more information as well on this on the events that are going on in terms of the new aggressiveness of, of soybean cyst nematode. And we're seeing that in Ontario. We're seeing here's just one of our plots from last year and in, in the Rodney area where we're looking at the 88788 source of resistance really being challenged by some of the field populations. And this population of cyst nematode in this field wasn't what I would say exceptionally high when it can't, comes to, um, say, the Peking or the, 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 these new adapted populations. It was still relatively low, and, but you can see under favorable environmental conditions, you know, we 50% or more yield loss. And the other component here, and I'll touch on it later, is the interaction between soybean cyst nematode and sun death syndrome increases the, the impact on, on, those, on soybean varieties, in particular the 88788 source of resistance. And we do have the Peking source of resistance, which is very effective, as you can see in this field and in, in this field here. And so important, one of the, the keys is, is um, knowing what you've got this year, get out there and scout, and then plan for the future. And that's, I think, one of the big take-homes for, for both from Tracy in my perspective will be the information you get from this year will be able to uh, be utilized for, for next year. And so the big question when it comes to soybean cyst nematode is, hey, they're toast this year, right? With all these unprecedented conditions, they gotta be drowned, they're, they're waterlogged and, and all of that. And the quick answer is nope. They're, they're still there, they're surviving. Um, some of the research uh, um, literature will show that soybean cyst nematode um, under limited oxygen environments underwater can survive up to 630 plus days, you know, and that's only because they shut it off at 630 days. So those cysts, eggs, being in that dormant stage are, are very uh, hardy and, and, and will survive with that. One concern though is with the moisture, water erosion, all of those, that's a perfect method by which you move soybean cyst nematode. And so that could inc increase our, our spread this year in certain field. The good news though, is that because we've planted later, um, there will be less reproduction. Um, so therefore less generations, which would mean less cyst nematode potential at the end of the season than what we would have seen by having say one or two less 
um, cycles of soybean cyst nematodes. So that is that is one of the the good news uh, parts of that. Um, also, I mentioned that sudden death syndrome is one of those pathogens that increases under soybean cyst nematode, and and SDS loves these conditions that we just had and are having this cool moist conditions, wet fields um, are, are, are prone to, to seeing high levels of SDS and that. And, uh, and although we have always talked about planting later as a, as a method by which we could calendar um, date later um, as a way to avoid sudden death syndrome, this year those cool wet conditions stayed so long that whether we planted, uh, you know, uh, early May conditions were early June conditions or mid June conditions as well. So um, the calendar planting mid to late June may not have um, the, the 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 impact in reducing SDS of what we've seen in the past, and we'll know better as as the season progresses here. And also, um, if the predictions are right in terms of continued um, um, above. Um, precipitation uh, for for this summer, um, then those late rains into, you know, not normally we talk about mid to late July, it's going to be those August um, rains that are going to push um, SDS symptoms um, this year. And so that may be something, again, to, to be on the lookout um, for increased uh, SDS. There's nothing we can do about it in the field um, right now, um, other than if you've had a resistant uh, tolerant variety and levo type uh, seed treatment in there, there's nothing we can do, but we can get that information for for planning for for next year as well. And then a lot of questions around white mold, of course. Um, you know, if we end up having the, the as with the late planting, late development here, um, and and cool wet conditions, that is always um, something to be concerned about when it comes to to white mold. A lot of that will depend on the environmental conditions during flowering. If we end up with those hot dry conditions, that will reduce our risk. Um, but also, um, if it continues to be cool wet, that again is is uh, uh, reason to be concerned on on the white mold side of things. We have a lot of products that are available <laughs> for white mold control. You know, in our trials. Um, here in Ontario, we've seen, you know, the Cotegras, the Strigo Pros, um, Cotegras, as I mentioned, Acapellas, the Allegros, all of these have been very effective against white mold. Um, the challenge will be the timing on that as well. And also, just like I mentioned with um, the foliar leaf diseases in corn, as well as gibberella ear rot, the purpose of your targeted intention for that fungicide is important in terms of where you're going to the application timing. If we are looking at a, uh, a foliar leaf disease in soybean or that plant health effect, then we're often looking at that R3 application timing, which is too late when we're talking about a white mold in general, particularly under favorable environmental conditions. That's where we've got to go more towards the R1, R2, you know, flower um, production, full flower, um, those those stages to to protect those blossoms from um, early early infections and in that. So again, that timing. The one good thing we do have, uh, and I was just talking with Damon Smith the other day from the University of uh, Wisconsin and uh, the development of who developed the Sporecaster uh, prediction model risk predictor for, for white mold. Um, it is um, up and running again this year. It is available to Ontario producers. The maps are there as well. Your iPhone or Android devices, um, you can um, go in there and, and set up your field locations and it will provide you, um, after you've answered certain questions in there, it'll provide you with a, a risk uh, predictor in terms of either low, high, or, or medium. And the important part here is, is from a, a timing standpoint or a fungicide timing standpoint to, to help and uh, assist us with uh, um, the, um, the timing of, of those fungicides. Because that's always been one of the important or, or most difficult components when it comes to, to white mold management is not only getting the, um, the fungicide into the canopy or into the flowers where we need them, but also in terms of uh, um, just that timing and that. And this will, this will help us as well. So, and if you are, uh, I know many of you 
uh, followed uh, Youth Sportcaster last year and uh, helped us in terms of providing feedback to Damon to to make the model better in that. If uh, if you can continue to do that and uh, get us tell us both the pros and cons of of the Sportcaster model, that would be a, a benefit to us to to make it better. And you're going to see more and more. Um, of these type of uh, uh, prediction models and tools available. There's uh, a number in terms of both for, say, corn rust, uh, some Twitter. Um, Twitter's being used now to monitor uh, different diseases as well. And Dave, Dr. Dave Hooker and I here at, at Ridgetown and, and our Chasma are looking at, uh, um, looking at the uh, um, gibberell ear rot, mycotoxin, um, forecast model as well, very similar to what the Doncast and Weed is as well. So we'll be asking many of you as well to help us uh, with evaluations for that uh, as well. And as we said, when it comes to models and that, probably the most uh, um, traditional one that we've used the longest has been the Doncast in wheat. And this year um, going, you saw that the models were predicting very high for a Fusarium head blight risk. Um, we are starting to see early symptoms in Essex, Chatham, Kent, a Fusarium head blight. It was just out in plots on campus here. Um, we are starting to see um, Fusarium head blight symptoms out there. Um, overall, they've been generally light um, in, in most fields that I've have been I've seen, but there are some uh, that are showing severe fusarium head blight uh, um, symptoms this year. Again, many of those ones had issues around that fungicide timing, both in terms of variability within the field, but more importantly, uh, the challenge of getting the fungicide. Um, on in those fields because of the the wet conditions and not being able to time the fungicide with the the growth stage as 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 we normally would do so that definitely potentially had an impact on on efficacy there as well so the fusarium head blight um, dawn side of things it's still early right now um, but uh, it's something to 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 keep in mind and uh, we'll know quickly over the next uh, a week or so. Um, how that's going to uh, develop, say, in the southwest and then across the province as well. And as Tracy mentioned, there's a number of different uh, diseases uh, and insect pests out there that uh, we keep monitoring from from our from other areas, and particularly in the Midwest U.S. And we're starting to see, um, just like soybean gall midge, um, other ones you've heard us talk about uh, a tar spot on corn in in the U.S. This was a, a quite uh, destructive disease last year that uh, um, ended up uh, affecting from from Iowa all the way into to Michigan so it is very close to Ontario um, you know the, the, the conditions uh, cooler um, those wet conditions um, moisture dews all of those things are, are favorable for for tar spot and so here are some of the symptoms that you want to look at it's just very similar to what we would see with um, on our maple trees or some of the uh, trees around your house in that where you have those tar-like lesions occurring on on the leaves themselves it can also affect the husks in that and in many cases you can have a, um, a, a white or yellow halo and necrotic uh, lesion around those tar spots it's look very similar to say eye spot in corn but much larger and that so these are some of the symptoms that you may want to um, be out looking out for. Um, as I said, we haven't found tar spot in Ontario as of yet, but it's something that uh, should be out there looking for, um, just as we would say with, with Goss's wilt and that. So another disease potentially to that may be favored by the late season as well as uh, uh, potentially the cooler, wetter um, season to, to potentially come. As I mentioned, some resources uh, that can help you in, in gaining a lot of information when it comes to, to diseases and that. We've been part of the, the Crop Protection Network through the GFO. Um, a lot of corn, soybean, wheat um, information there as well as um, as Tracy mentioned, Field Crop News will have articles there, and then our OMAFRA publications, particularly when it comes to the fungicides, insecticides, with the Pub A12, the Field Crop Protection Guide has, um, you know, a lot of those the products information there, as well as the Agronomy Guide, 
as in there. I'd like to also acknowledge a lot of our supporters and uh, funders um, from, from CAP, et cetera, and many of our U.S. colleagues um, uh, for their help um, with some of the research that we've been uh, doing. So this year, you know, one of the uh, important messages is going to be just get out there. Scout, scout, scout. It is going to be the year of the unusual. Pests are going to be at different uh, pests are going to be found on, on corn, soybeans, wheat, etc. at different stages than we normally will see. So it will be the year of the unusual. So uh, don't, don't be, uh, don't, don't expect the unusual. I guess that's basically all I can say on that side. I think that'll be it. I think, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And if we can have some, if there are any questions, I'd be pleased to, to answer them. We, uh, we do have some questions. Uh, so what would one do if tar spot is suspected and who do you call? Yeah, so on, on the tar spot side of things, yeah, please. Um, so on the tar spot, there are, um, we are, as I said, working with our U.S. colleagues and, um, and that on terms of the efficacies, um, trying to get a handle on uh, the, the fungicides and their efficacy and effectiveness against tar spot. Um, if, you, if you do see or suspect any tar spot in Ontario, please give me a call. It is one that we are very keen on uh, finding. As we saw last year um, in the U.S., um, the disease went escalated quite quickly under favorable conditions. And so it is one that uh, you want to be on top of. Um, you know, they went from low incidence to high severity in, in the matter of, you know, a, a couple of weeks or so. So again, um, you can have substantial or significant or severe damage quite quickly. So um, speed is important in identifying it and, and putting those alerts out and, and getting products. So again, when we talk about those, those foliar fungicides in corn, I've just talked about two timings, right? That tassel timing for those general foliar leaf diseases. We talked about the ear rots and, and that timing at uh, R1, that silking stage is important. When it comes to tar spot, it's sort of like our stripe rust scenario in wheat. Once we find the disease there, um, you know, we had this uh, a few years ago, regardless if we were only a week away from a T3 application in fungicide, we, we found that the best course of action was to deal with it right away, not to allow the, um, the, the, the disease or to the stripe rust to develop quickly and, and get ahead of us to the point that it really didn't matter if we we're going to put a, a fusarium application there because yield was already gone at that point or we had lost substantial plant health and, and, uh, and yield potential at that point. Same thing from, uh, from what we learned in the U.S. This, the last year was that uh, the potential um, damage that can occur from tar spot was so severe that it, it needs to be dealt with quickly. Awesome. And just a follow up to that. So where is tar spot most likely to show up first? So, as I said, um, and many of you at, at SWAC uh, last year, we had a good friend of mine, Marty Chilvers from Michigan State University here with us. And, and so it is in mid Michigan. So it's only a few two or three counties away from from Ontario, uh, very similar. It's actually farther into Michigan than uh, say Goss's wilt um, has been. And so in Ontario, just like most of our, our diseases and that where we start looking for um, diseases that are coming particularly from the Midwest and that is in the Southwest. So we're gonna see Essex, Chatham, Kent, um, West Elgin along um, the Northern uh, Lake Erie shoreline is probably going to be the areas that uh, more likely will be the first areas. Anything that ends up being moved by natural forces, whether it's it's wind, rain, those storm fronts and that that move up um, and so come up. And so that's why the, the southwest is the area that we normally um, would be considered the higher risk or more probability of finding. If it's a different disease or pathogen that is uh, dependent on movement, say, by equipment and that, that's more hit and miss. That, that uh, um, changes in terms of predictability in, in that. But for sure, it'll be uh, Essex, Kent, Lambton um, in the south. Okay, hey, great. Um, just a quick question. I know on behalf of Grain Farmers of Ontario, uh, we saw a lot of variability in our Dawn test results. What do you think the biggest reason for that is? 
Well, in terms of, yeah, we had to have that one. Okay, um, so when it comes to um, the variability that we saw last year, a lot of it came from the sampling side of things. And, and so from, from when we talk about the sampling in that is there's just the variability in the samples themselves. And um, some of the work done this past uh, winter um, through particularly through GFO funding, OMAFRA funding, um, done here at Ridgetown through, through Dr. Art Shasma here, found that the variability in the sampling itself and um, um, increase with the subsamples, right? So as you take a subsample from, say, a probe sample or, or so, you're going to get a higher potential of, of variability from that because you're taking such a small sample from a larger um, pool. And uh, one way that uh, we're able to, to decrease that variability was by grinding the entire sample that came out of, say, the probe. So, uh, say, a five pound or, or, or so sample that uh, uh, came through there, and that was premixed, and that became very much more uniform. The variability decreased considerably because now you've ground. A lot that entire sample, and by subsampling in that, it's a much more uniform sample to start with. And so, um, that is uh, uh, one area that we're all looking at to see that we can reduce some of that variability. So, that sampling variability. The other um, thing that we found out this year was through uh, participation through the elevators with known uh, Dawn samples that were sent out. To various elevators, I believe we had 82 that sent samples back. The the test kits themselves performed very well overall. There were certain, still you know a, a few odd ones that were a little higher than we would have expected. Uh, so that shows some some variability, say um, at the location itself. But overall, the test kits performed as expected, and so they were they were testing or finding out. Um, they were accurate in terms of the amount of dawn in those samples and that. But again, a lot of it is that that sample variability. So anything we can do to increase um, or decrease that variability in the sample itself, such as grinding the full sample, can can get us a better result. Okay, um, I believe that's all the time we have for today. I want to extend a thank you to both Tracy and Albert for providing us with the information um, and kind of guiding us in the right direction for this upcoming season. Uh, and thank you to our participants for participating and joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you guys showing up for sure. Uh, just a note, we will be posting this on YouTube. So if there's any information that you might need later at, at a later time, you can get it there. All right, thanks all for coming out and have a great day.